Thanks, Jack. You're too kind. So my talk's going to be about hardware and how to think about optimization in any sort of engineering problem you encounter, how that relates to health and how people approach health today and where they get things wrong. So if I were to ask you to think about what are the strongest materials in the world and what might that look if you were to imagine a fictitious situation where someone generated this. And whatever you might think is probably what an AI large language model would also think because it just absorbs the aggregate of what humans have written. What does it mean if scientists make some super material? And so I put this prompt into AI And I got an image. Uh, you know, it looks like a, a standard sort of scientist in a lab mixing some sort of chemicals in some glass beakers. Seems very sciencey. If you talk about some super strong material, that seems pretty reasonable. If you were to think about some comic book idea of somehow they made this super shield material, how did they do it? It would be things mixing together and suddenly it is just there, it appears out of the myth. Uh, but that's not actually how things advance. Not today. We used to just have chemistry. It looks a bit different. It looks like this image on the left here. I was the person taking the photo. You see something glowing. I can't show you exactly what that is. And it looks like complex, but somewhat janky machinery. You just have to build those machines. And what it really looks like on the inside, unfortunately, I can't show you that, but it is inside the server rack is the machine that gets you very strong materials. And what it produces is something that sometimes looks like this, a thing that can look like quite a few different things, something where it's not about the raw material. These raw materials are actually quite ordinary. Same materials you'll find uh, in, in different aircraft, advanced thermoplastic composites, carbon fiber. But no air, aerospace company can make a part that looks like this. You can't mold something like this. This replaces an INVAR component for satellites. And that's the application. It has an extremely low coefficient in, of thermal expansion. So this actually isn't one of these ultra strong parts. I think it's a very interesting part though. It's this entire component is hollow. You can't see that. It's 10x lighter than INVAR. And so what that means is if you have one pound of these parts going into a satellite, that is 10 pounds of part that you are not putting in the satellite. So you have this 10 to one ratio. So one pound of this material saves you 10 pounds. Then you just do the math on what does it cost to launch a pound into space? And so that's about the machinery. You just need to build those machines. If you want to do scientific analysis, you can, but it comes after. You can get some expensive machine. You can do a micro CT scan of your part and you can do what I did, which is try to come up with some grand unified theory of what does it all mean? And I say, oh, it's, it's this abstraction of shape and materials, and, and this is the, the reason that traditional laminates are so different from this other thing. And I call it the strongest materials because that's just a quick thing that I can say. But actually, no customer cares about that. It's not a thing I would say to customers. It's not a thing that was ever said to customers. No one needs this chart to know that the part solves a problem for them. And so, of course, Nassim Taleb, uh, for those here who are Bitcoiners, I know some people are here just for the health. Uh, Nassim Taleb has a, a very severe case of Bitcoin derangement syndrome. Uh, I, I think there's no known cure yet at this time. Uh, you know, I think we're all hoping he gets better soon. He also unfortunately came down with a, a severe case of COVID derangement syndrome. But he has made a few good points over the years. And one of those was how scientists take credit but a lot of things were built first by engineers. A lot of the things that are foundational to the technology we enjoy today, 
since most of you probably got here on a plane that uses a jet engine. And so there's a question of why all these things happen and why science often isn't effective. And it ties back to legibility. When we started with agriculture, that's when humans became legible and became less free. When you have someone farming in the same place, someone else can come and say, give me a portion of your food or I'm going to kill you and I know where you live. And so that's the problem. It's they know where you live, they know where you're producing things, and then they get you. And that was the start of taxation. That was the start of statism. And, and people take these actions without knowing why they're taking their actions. They're taking the actions that they know how to take. So Richard Feynman brought up the idea of uh, cargo cult science, that there was this tribe in Africa where during the war, I forget who exactly, maybe U.S. planes would come and they would deliver, they would have surplus food, all these materials. And then the war ended and the tribe said, you know, it sure would be great if we could keep getting this stuff that came from the sky. So maybe we can make airplanes too. And they didn't quite understand how all of it worked. So they, they did their best, but it just wasn't good enough to actually get anywhere. And you have the same, th the same thing today in universities. People use the expensive machine. They use the million dollar scanning electron microscope, the same thing that would be used to exfiltrate your private key from a device such as, you know, you know the devices. So how do you optimize? If you choose something that is legible, one dimension, you understand it, it's relatively easy. You have one variable that you change and you look at what is the output. And you take a number of steps and you travel along a path to get somewhere. And maybe you find yourself in a local minimum, a uh, local maximum, but not the global one. But if you're in one dimension, screw it. Just look at all the possibilities, you'll figure it out. <laughs> but as you start adding more dimensions, things get more complicated. If you want to find your global minimum, suddenly you have to take more paths and it becomes more computationally expensive. And if you get a lot of dimensions, which the real world is, suddenly you have absolutely no clue where you're going. And if you try to do an iterative process, maybe in, in, in software and machine learning, you can do a large number of iterations, but in the physical world where you're working with atoms, you cannot traverse a highly dimensional space. You're not going to get anywhere. And so the problem with the fiat world is it funds things that are legible. If you say, I have this hyperdimensional space that I'm traversing and I have a good idea of where I'm going, but you can't explain it very well, no one's going to fund it. So with the company that I served, we had some NSF funding early on at one point, but it was all academic reviewers. They didn't understand what was going on. And so the Missile Defense Agency had to step in and, and follow on the funding and take the phase two and say, yeah, we need this stuff. And so Bitcoin's rather different. Uh, Bitcoin is not by force. It's not by committee. It is purely free. And what happens is on Bitcoin, when you fund the wrong thing, it's very simple. You have less Bitcoin. So through that iterative process, Bitcoin always will get to the truth. Let's skip a few slides. So if you really want to make progress, you, you have to be okay not understanding everything you're doing. And as Jack mentioned in his introduction, I didn't fully understand it, and I still don't fully understand the LEDs I'm using. But if you insist on only doing things you understand, you're not going to move the needle. And so how does, what does all of this have to do with health or biology? And I noticed a few things as I was working with these different materials, which was there would be certain uncertainties that would come up where I'd say, can we optimize this or that? What is the crystallinity of the matrix? What is the shape of the crystalline structure? And I, I looked at a paper that was saying, well, 
you think there's these, this transcrystalline structure that's originating from the fiber surface, but actually this is not the case. Transcrystallinity does not exist. Mm -hmm. And so all these people, you know, they have this minutia. And it almost gets to the point where the things you're discussing, it's like a, a religious person dancing. Well, how many angels can really dance on the head of a pin? That's what it turns into to a large degree. And I thought, this is a solid material. It's rigid. And we still have no clue what's going on. You can slice it up all you want, keep looking, and you still aren't quite sure. And realize, you know, biology is a lot harder than this. Biology is far more complex. It's far more dynamic. And so if, if we can't figure this out about this two, three-phase system, how the heck do we really understand biology? And so there, there's a problem, which is the academics, when they look at the machines, when they look at what they're studying, they make toy machines. They are cargo culting. They are emulating doing something that is actually useful. And you can take any substance. If you want to say, I'm doing architectural engineering, you could take a gingerbread house and do structural analysis on it, and maybe you would win an Ig Nobel Prize for that. <laughs> and you notice that all the machines, though, that they're using, the machines they don't make, the machines they, they fill their lab with, those are machines that are made by real companies. And you look at what the cost of some of these machines are. I remember I was talking to someone in biology, and they said, yeah, we, we, we bought this $10,000 incubator, just basically a controlled oven. It's like, why the heck does that cost $10,000? That's ridiculous. And these people are not running companies, the so-called science. They are untethered from economic reality, as are the people that make the decisions to give them money that they did not earn through honest means. This ghost skipping. I, are you able to stop it? Can you manually adjust the slides for me and then I can tell you? Te digo cuando vamos a la próxima. Necesitamos pararlo. Te voy a decir que next slide. Y me, no, it's this. Okay. So you can look at a red light device that's used in a hospital. Costs, if I remember correctly, about $200,000, which interestingly, it's about the same power output as, as a device that I sell for about $1,000. And there's actually a pretty good gross margin on that. It's really easy. Anyone else could also do it as well. There's a really low barrier to entry. But the hospitals don't do it. No one in the hospital can do it. And this, it, it turns out that this was a, a study where they took a 57-year-old man who had a severe case of COVID uh, and also some complications. I think he may have been diabetic and completely reversed the symptoms doing this. No one really cares because you know you can't sell light in a good business model. It's not a drug. Uh, but you look at what's happening with the light. We have a chart here that's showing these blue bars are the price of LEDs. So it's, it's only very recently that all of these LEDs have become incredibly uh, inexpensive. Next slide. Uh, and the thing is, if you can't make something useful, there's nothing to study. So you need to start making the useful things. And the reality is now there's a lot more tools to make useful things. We have electronics, we have software, we have sensors. Everything is highly underutilized. And everyone's treating it still like World War II chemical warfare for medicine. Next slide. You don't always need to have the really clever scientific thing. Sometimes it's more about the infrastructure. So clean water, plumbing, all these things built by civil engineers have done quite a bit for health and, and well-being. I did a similar thing. I technically solved COVID. People think it's very strange when I say this because I say, wait, but the whole thing happened. It's well. From it, uh, let, let me tell you a joke. So there's a, a joke uh, about a mathematician who, uh, who, and and mathematicians are very interested in proving things theorems. Who walks by a room and sees uh, a bucket of water on a desk, and in the corner he also sees that a fire has started. And he looks back at the bucket and says, "Ah, a solution exists," and he keeps on walking. And so that's the sense in which I say that, you know, I solved COVID, that I came to the correct conclusion. 
but because of the fiat world, no one actually bothered to do it. It's, it's a very simple solution. Any middle schooler should be able to do it. I thought there'd be a hundred other companies. Instead, there were a bunch of fake companies doing fake products that somehow got tons of funding from VCs. And to this day, no one's built this device. Uh, so so I, I, I've come up with a principle, which is uh, Michael's uh, VC retardation principle, which is that the VCs are more retarded than you can possibly imagine, even when you take into account Michael's VC retardation principle. <laughs> and so you look at what are the things that are actually moving forward. Uh, some people, uh, you know, like Peter Thiel, like to talk about this great stagnation theory. Remember, Peter Thiel is an attorney. He invests in Facebook, but he's not a tech guy, not really. And I made a website that proves him wrong, uh, Civilization Metrics. So I it. All it does is show a few charts like this in real units, not in dollars, actual production of stuff. You can look at energy on the left. You can look at the semiconductor devices which ties into what can you do with LEDs. So all that's right. Everything really is growing. And the barriers to developing hardware are collapsing. So this is uh, Sam Zeloff, who I heard was developing chips for low tens of thousands of dollars, basically a complete fab in his garage, uh, scavenging parts. And, and that's the thing, if you're scrappy, if you have something you really want to do and you're serious about it, you'll get it built. You can't build stuff when you're just trying to build stuff because you think, oh, it would be cool to do a startup and you try to hire people to do things, you buy machines from someone else. And most hardware companies make very little. They have one little narrow widget. Usually other people are making most of the components on that widget. Uh, but, you know, they, they can sell that because, in fact, the simpler the widget is, the simpler it is for an investor to understand. Uh, I have a, a friend who's at Caltech uh, who's developing uh, a system that's not going to replace an MRI. It's not quite as good as an MRI. Uh, but if, if you're from a, a very underdeveloped country, you know, such as Canada... Very <laughs> communist country. You might notice that their healthcare system is lacking. They have very few MRI machines. And, you know, you'd be lucky to get one, you know, if within a few months. I don't know if they have two, three. Maybe there's more. I, I didn't actually check. But there's not very many. And you, you can't, you do at some point need to look at the, an actual thing and, and evaluate it. And again, we get back to the manufacturing. This is a guy who wanted to build a thing. I think I actually got the, the description wrong. I had to message him. What it's actually doing is it's a pulse of a microwave or, um, or a laser, and that laser heats up a cell, and the water in that cell expands. And as it expands, it sends out an acoustic pulse, and they measure that acoustic pulse. And so that's not quite as good as an MRI, but much cheaper, so you get something in between. Uh, another thing, I, I don't know where you're going to use this, but I, I saw an article that, you know, General Atomics is building a desktop particle accelerator. So that seemed neat. So figured I'd throw that in there. There's tons of stuff that's happening in hardware. And if, if you're Peter Thiel, going back to that, you don't actually know what's really going on. You're just reading the headlines. You walk into a plane and you say, well, it goes at the same subsonic speed. And if you were going to be able to afford a private jet anyway, you're not actually quite noticing that the turbines are completely different in that plane. Or maybe even if you're a few decades older than me, maybe you've forgotten how loud the planes used to be on the ground and all these other factors. And so going back to you know the intersection of, of, of tech and health, I find some people want to return to this ideal pastoralist way of life. The reality is you look at the old architecture, you try to do the safety and a moose thing. I'm, I'm, I'm not speaking of it just as an example of, of saying, oh, we had this great architecture in the past. What happened to the great architecture? The reality is most people were living in abject poverty and squalor. They were not living in the nice architectural buildings. Uh, so there needs to be a, an integration of both technology 
and getting the benefits of it without getting the downside. So if you take a very poor village, the number one thing you can do to increase their, their economic prosperity is giving them artificial light that they can use at night. And I know that's, that's, that's sacrilege here to say that. And I also would say, I like 5G, I like fast internet. It's really nice. Uh, <laughs> and, and the reality is, if you do it the wrong way, it's damaging, but there's a way that's less damaging, which is what I want to. And it's really simple, but no one really cares about doing it. But you can change these LEDs, it's, it's not expensive. And so, as some of you probably know who this guy is, I, I noticed at one point when I was working on lights, uh, this guy put $750,000 into a company called Circadian Optics. And what was Circadian Optics trying to do? These, these sad, these bright lights? They said, ah, it's an eyesore, the lamp on a desk. The physical structure, we need to make it prettier. Here, it's like a little sculpture on your desk. So they made the little sculpture, and they put the same shitty LED in it with lots of the really bad blue light, with the same cyan gap, with the same violet gap, and the same low overall intensity. But it's a nice little sculpture. So again, here we have the cargo cult. And so I'd say, why should we consider what's possible with hardware and ways of thinking about how that might apply to health and medicine? And I was noticing that if you look at a molten drop of metal, if you change the charge on that, suddenly that goes to something that has really high surface energy, really wants to hold itself together, to such low surface energy, it drips down through a fine mesh just by changing the charge. They say, okay, what are some of these wacky people talking about this light and magnetism and electricity talking about? And it's, Oh yeah, weren't they talking about grounding, charging? And you have to then have some epistemic humility with that, which is we don't know how to control the body in a, a super precise way from an electrical perspective. But if this is how much we can change with molten metal, what is happening at a cellular level with very small adjustments to your charge? And by the way, don't, don't, don't ask me why I was looking into molten metals and what I'm thinking about there. Uh, moving on. So with electronics, for instance, uh, you can get bandages that accelerate wound healing. And that's a simple device. That could be made cheaply. None of these things necessarily have to go through regulated channels. And there shouldn't be that much regulation anyway, or any really. And you ask, okay, what's possible now with photonics? I remember a, a, an E friend who worked at Dolby, not a doctor, was telling me about if you get this terahertz radiation applied to certain materials, it gets you superconductivity. I thought, well, that's interesting. What does that have to do with humans? Well, what happens when you apply terahertz radiation to humans? Who knows? But again, it's back to if we don't really understand how to change the electromagnetic properties in a solid material, if we cannot generate and scale room temperature superconductors, how are we going to manipulate the human body, which is far more complex? And, and by the way, I, I don't understand any of this quantum physics stuff. I didn't go that deep. But the starting point is, is partial differential equations. I took an intro class. I had an interest in math. No one is, is taking that if they're a doctor. If, if you're in pre-med, you, you take remedial calculus with some name to not feel as bad about the fact that it's really just remedial calculus, and then you stop there. You don't know about this stuff. And if you're developing medical hardware, most of the people in that space are, are not the best engineers. If you're the best engineer, you don't want to be on a Medtronic because you can't do something interesting because you're going to have tons of red tape. You're going to want to work in aerospace, energy, oil and gas, something like that. So nothing really moves forward all that much on the hardware side. And what else can you do with light? You can do photodynamic therapy. And again, no one really wants to do this because the model of drugs works so well, where you inject a dye into the body, or you can inhale a dye, and then you hit it with light. So again, this is just what are the tools that can be used to manipulate the human body 
in more complex ways. And going back to the materials, if you want to make the absolute strongest aerospace parts, it's not about some clever mixture of chemicals. There is no clever mixture of chemicals that will get you there. You need the machine that can manipulate the materials and the things that you know how to use in new ways. And it's the same thing with a human. You're not gonna magically mix some cure-all cancer drug. You need to do the hard work and make machines and play with the different tools that are available. And so I'd, I'd say people are not ready to do science yet. There are so many basics. This is a house and the thermal imaging. A house is a terrible environment. What does a house do? A house absorbs heat during the day and then in the evening it's radiating that heat out to you. You need to be getting cold at night. I didn't know this for years. My sleep was destroyed. I was staying up late. This is before I even knew about light. And, and that was dramatically impacting my life as a college student. And, and I just thought, well, this is normal. It, it certainly wasn't normal. And so a lot of people think they want to do some advanced medicine science. Humans are less healthy now than in a natural environment. So the question is, how do you get to zero? You need to get to zero before you start getting clever. Mike, my house doesn't look like that. Just so you know that. <laughs> yeah, you get more thermal mass. You, you pay more for the house. That's the thing. You also... You just take the walls out. Yeah, you see the McMansion houses. They're made with lousy materials. If you have a smaller house with better quality materials, and that goes back to what are your values on fiat versus on Bitcoin. And so again, looking at what do people do out in the world? What are these IQ tests that you can say, do these people know anything? And so there was a company called Eight Sleep, which you know, maybe it's an okay product, you know, it's probably expensive, but decent idea. Raised $80 million from Founders Fund. And Founders Fund, again, ties back to Peter Thiel, he had this quote, which is, we were promised flying cars, but all we got was 144 characters. That's a great marketing line, fantastic marketing line. And so you tell your LPs, hey, we're this, we're this incredibly innovative fund and we're going against the mainstream, we're, we're more conservative. I was actually so heretical that I was disinvited after being invited to the Hereticon event that their, their marketing guy put on. Uh, it, so Eight Sleep had accessory products. They had glass. They said, oh, blue blocking glasses. We'll do that too. And I, I messaged guys and said, okay, so does this block 400 to 500 nanometers? And of course, they had tons of VC funding. So, you know, they, they had outsourced their, their customer service to who knows who. And they said, oh, yes, yes, it, it blocks all the way. All, all the way 400, 500? Yes, 100%. Okay. Obviously, you can see the, the clear glass on the left block almost no light but they were selling this product and so you, you go to delian this guy who's now raised 50 million to do space manufacturing and space manufacturing i think it's awesome i i thought you know that's the thing maybe i'll be working on in, in some number of decades but this guy is a bit confused about his colors and so and and i called him out on this and he, he sort of got angry and um the thing is i'm very skeptical if you can't figure out that a clear lens doesn't stop blue light if you're going to be the guy starting the first breakthrough space manufacturing company and by the way they talked about leds and all this you know real manufacturing they said well now maybe that's a bit too hard so what are they doing drugs they're trying to be a pharma company <laughs> that's what they pivoted to the the red lens is it's 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 really simple i mean it's someone was going to come up with it eventually and, and it continues to this day. So now I was working on, on defense before VCs were working on defense. Um, but now it's it's the hot area because now there's, there's war breaking out. And so A16Z is getting into it and they have American dynamism. And so I looked this way, it's like, who's on the American dynamism team? It, it, if you look at all these people, I have this tweet out, every single one of them you look at, at their LinkedIn, if they even list what they did for their undergrads, it's finance, political philosophy. You know, all these people are these, these esoteric, there's just such brilliant thinkers. They can really understand the war and the engineering. So it, it, it's a mockery of, of the people who come to them for capital. And you almost must think maybe it's deliberate. 
Maybe they don't want real founders. They want people willing to subject themselves to the humiliation ritual, because once you do that, they have you. And so we, if you're in Bitcoin, you know Mark Andreessen is one of the shitcoin VCs, Coinbase, all the shitcoin stuff. But now these people, it's like a cartel, you know? First they do drugs and they say, well, what if we want to go legit? We want to do real business. So now they want to this. They want to get into the memes of saying, yeah, we do the things that move the world forward. They want to live off of this sort of stolen valor. And so same that Elon Musk, he was anti-nuclear, he's pushing electric cars, pushing government subsidies, but people need heroes. And, and why do they need heroes? They need heroes because of how fucked up the fiat world is. Because if there are heroes in the world that are working on the great things that somehow seem cut off, then maybe it's, a, it's, it's okay, someone else will do it and they can feel a little bit better about the world because it is painful to embrace the reality. And so I say, what are the heuristics we can use to get somewhere it, talking about health? It's nature. I did the van life for a while, going around climbing, mountain biking, and it's incredible how well you can sleep in a van because a van is a shell of steel. It's better than a camper, which will be made out of fiberglass and resin. It gets really cold. If I wake up and it's 30 degrees, it's maybe a bit too cold, but if I wake up and it's 45 degrees, I would sleep so well. And as I was walking through a forest in Squamish, it was sunny and hot until I entered the forest and I walked past a boulder. And as I stood next to that boulder, I noticed how nice and cool it felt standing next to me. I realized it's radiation. And humans radiate out a thousand watts of power is a lot you think wait wait a second he, he got that wrong it can't be a thousand watts he'd freeze to how does it work because a human on net loses a hundred watts and the way it works out is that most of that radiation we get right back into us from our environment because everything is radiating some amount we're a bit hotter than our environment usually so we cool down the sun's out you know maybe we're warming up and i looked at what are the wavelengths of a human? And I'm not entirely clear on where the temperature receptors are, but it made me think maybe there's something fundamentally different about radiative cooling versus ambient cooling. If you have air conditioner versus if you can have a cold surface. And so I imagined a room that has a glass dome over it or some other IR transparent material so that you can be exposed to the night sky which is, you know, three Kelvin or whatever, extremely cold. So suddenly you can radiate heat out. And the key thing is the radiation can slightly go through your body. If you're cooling your body directly with ambient air, it is an infinitely thin, effectively you have, or not, but you're, you're doing it on a surface. But like glass, you get what's called radiative conductivity. So the radiation goes through. So maybe you can cool yourself to a greater degree without feeling chilly, because you don't want to feel too chilly and some pleasant, but you still want that cold exposure. So all these concepts are just, how do you build these things? No one in HVAC or uh, building development is thinking about this the same way all the lights are, are quite lousy. And so thinking about what this age of light and what I don't know that much about plus society, and I'm hoping to learn more about it, it's that we can create new shelling points. We don't need these false heroes. We can look to things that actually work and through those heuristics, navigate the world and get somewhere that's actually going to be useful. And so recently I've come up with some ideas uh, and I think I do have a path to restoring some of what has been lost in the world. And I used to think that, you know, sure, we have Bitcoin, hyper-Bitcoinization is gonna occur. I remember when I first got into Bitcoin, it was 2017, October. And then of course there was the run-up in December and I thought, ah, so here's hyper-Bitcoinization. I'm glad I got here just in time. <laughs> and, and, and obviously that wasn't it, but because of what I had built in materials and aerospace, I had this absolute understanding very quickly after finally getting in. And 
I always knew that Bitcoiners were going to be the people restoring the world to the correct order. And I, I'm still not entirely sure when that's going to happen, but I'm beginning to think that moment might be coming sooner than I previously expected, where now that these VCs are trying to get into the physical world, maybe with Bitcoin where it is, we're starting to reach that point where the intersection of aerospace and defense technologies and energy and advanced materials will coalesce and Bitcoiners can retake mimetic territory that's been stolen. And so if, if, if anyone wants to chat about that afterwards, I, I'd be happy to talk to people more about that. I've, I know I've talked to a few people about what I'm thinking there. And so, uh, yeah, I have a, a few sites. I, some people may have been expecting me to talk more about the, the LEDs and the different things. I've, I've written a decent amount on, on a few newsletters. Uh, so if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer those. And also, um, if you're into the LEDs, I know Matt is, is somewhere here in the audience. Yeah, Matt's right there. So if you've been getting LEDs from Chroma, if you've been working with that, he's really been keeping things running there. So please give a, a round of applause to him as well. Thank you, Matt. <laughs>